This week on Salwood Squad, we're on the Medway Estuary in Kent. Behind me is a Thames barge that in its time has seen a lot of history unfold along the coastlines of Britain. And it's going to have to be all hands on deck to return it to its former glory. Now, when we say Thames barge, we ain't talking about those things that chug up canals. We are talking a dirty, great seagoing ship that was once the very symbol of the River Thames. Our Thames barge is called Ina. She's 88 feet long, weighs 73 tonnes and is nearly 100 years old. She's being rebuilt inside this makeshift dry dock, the hull of an old freighter. Her owner, Luke Deards, is about to introduce the squad to their biggest challenge yet. <laughs> it's a boat within a boat. <laughs> Which one are we doing, this one or that no, one? No, you're doing that one. You're doing the one that still looks like a boat. Right, OK. <coughs> There is so much work here. Barges like Ina were the container trucks of yesteryear. The big posh ones took cargoes like grain, timber or bricks all along the south coast of England and as far off as Scotland, Ireland or even France. Others acted as delivery trucks taking goods from the big ocean going ships and bringing them further up the Thames to the warehouses of central London. Some even worked as dustbin lorries, taking London's waste downriver to be dumped at sea. They had their origins in the Middle Ages, but by the time Ina was launched in 1906, they'd become one of the most sophisticated sailing vessels ever built. So efficient at their job, that right up to the 1970s, they were able to hold their own against more modern transport. Barges were brilliantly suited to the shallow estuaries and rivers of the southeast, and their unique flat bottoms meant that they could float in just four feet of water. Bridges were no problem either. Their massive rigs could be raised or lowered by two men, allowing them to travel upriver where other sailing ships could not reach. Sadly, even such a brilliant design couldn't compete with modern diesel-powered ships, and by the 1970s, the age of the sailing barge was over. Today, our Ina is one of only two dozen or so still capable of sailing. But she's been out of the water for over a year now, and while a hull is in good shape, as the squad check her over, they soon realise that it's going to be a huge effort if she's going to sail again. Right, guys, what do we think? Huge task. Big, big task, yeah. It's a wood yard. Yeah. But yeah. if the hull's fairly sound, I mean, there's, there's rot still on the decking. So right. the decking's a priority, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the engine. There's an engine tucked at the back. Let me sit down. Right, sit this down. So you want decking. Decks, yeah. Yeah. What, deck and rot? Yeah, and rot, yes, yeah. good move. Deck and rot one, engine two. Yes, we've got to make sure it floats, haven't we? So it's, it's, it's got to be just to double check that it's watertight. I think you better leave some of that in there, Claire, because you're not a, you're not a boat right, and you could be pulling out the mm. wrong piece of boat. <laughs> right, okay. okay. Once the decking done, which goes towards making it watertight from the top as well. Wants masts. It wants done sails. That, it wants that. rigging. That comes with the masts and sails. Okay, fair enough. I think we should go and get the expert in and. I need the gaffer. Yeah. Because well, we've only got on three points so far. Yeah. Well, then point four. Everything else. Everything else, yeah. She's almost 100 years old, but Ina's only had two careful owners. Her entire working life was spent working for Ipswich grain merchants R&W Paul. Paul's owned 45 sailing barges down the years, using their huge holds to transport around 200 tonnes of grain at a time all along the south coast. She made her last commercial trip for Paul's in the early 1970s but they had a soft spot for barges and kept her on as a floating social club until two years ago, when, in need of a lot of work, they sold her to Luke. Luke's 24 and runs a pub, but barges have been in his blood since he was a boy. I mean, I've always been brought up on barges and lived around barges, and when you're younger, everything seems so much bigger. Um, the deck seemed so much wider and, and sort of as I grew up barges got smaller but the one thing that really drew me to the Ina it was just like being a kid on board again because everything's so big on her um, with the decks being so wide as well that it was just as if it was back then and yeah that, that really did attract me to her. Well, I mean we've been in the dry dock for a year now um, I've got to get the decks back on she's got to go back into the water because if she doesn't there's going to be more damage done uh, everything's really opening up, she's really drying out, so it, it really needs speeding up, it needs finishing off. I need a roof over my head. 
The man in charge of getting Ina back in the water is Luke's dad, Robert. He's a shipwright of the old school who specialises in barge restoration. He owns the yard and its unique workshop. Normally, to do the work, you'd need to take a ship like Ina into a fancy dry dock costing millions of pounds. Instead, Robert found an old freighter that was on its way to the scrap heap, chopped the end off and used it to keep Ina out of the water. Come and meet your new crew over here. Here we go, this is Robert. Hi. Hi, hi, hi Captain. He's, Luke, he's Luke's old man. He also knows a little bit about boats. So uh, you've had a look at it. Do you want to tell him what you think you've got to do? And then he'll Swim. tell you. Then yeah, he'll run the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you All tell right. him, then he'll tell you what you have to do. If you have a look at that, and tell us what we missed. Oh, lots of it. My first, my first comment was ask the expert, which <laughs> I thought was a pretty good assessment. So Have they you, covered? Where'd you start? Yeah, basically there. We covered it all. You started off with a deck as well, which we were talking. Yeah, yeah that's basically where you're going with, with it, is the deck. Lots of woodworking. Oh, love that. Blending muscles. Oh, it love that. It's serious woodwork oh. here, isn't it? And it's serious woodwork that needs to be done quick. Ian has been in the dock far longer than was planned. And, as his son keeps reminding him, being out of the water is beginning to do her no good at all. That's why he's called in the salvage squad. The hope is that three more willing workers will help get her back where she belongs, into the waters of the Thames estuary. If they're going to get Ina sailing again, Axel will have to turn grave robber, Claire will face a canvas bigger than any artist, and Jerry will be forced to walk the plank. Our Thames barge is called Ina. She's being rebuilt inside this makeshift dry dock, the hull of an old freighter. But before they can put her together, they're gonna have to take her apart. Most of Ina's old decking is, in barge speak, rotten as a pear, and will have to be hacked out before it can be replaced. While Jerry's still smashing out the old deck, Axel's about to start on the new deck. And we don't mean the stuff you knock up in your back garden to keep up with the neighbours. The decking on a barge has to be every bit as tough and waterproof as a hull, because fully laden, a barge is so low in the water that her decks are almost fully submerged. As a result, laying a new one is nothing like whacking down a few bits of mock oak from your local DIY centre. For a start, there are few straight lines on Ina, most of the 180 or so planks being a unique banana shape. Which means Axel is going to have to be pretty nifty with his measurements, or there'll be some nasty leaks come sailing time. Now you won't find the raw materials for barge building at your local timber merchant. Robert's bought up half a forest and sawn each tree into three inch thick sections. The trees Rob's bought are a hardwood called OPP, and Claire's busy cleaning a chunk, ready for Axel to mark out the shape of the plank. With the shape determined, Axel can rev up the saw and prove to Rob he's got the makings of a shipwright. The job takes an hour. But when Ina was built, all 26 feet of it would have been done by hand, just like when sailing barges first started to appear on the Thames in the Middle Ages. For hundreds of years, they remained pretty primitive, 
But then 150 years ago, the arrival of them new fangled railways and fancy steamships started killing off sailing boats left, right and centre. Back then, bookies wouldn't have given you 1,000 to 1 on the Thames barge surviving. And they'd have cleaned up if it were not for one Henry Dodd. In 1863, he came up with a cunning plan that turned the slow lumbering barges of his day into a cargo ship so fast and efficient that it remained in business until 30 years ago. His idea was barge racing. And it took off big time. Within a few years, both owners and builders were thinking of nothing more than making their barges faster and faster. The result was a ship crewed by two men, capable of carrying 200 tonnes of cargo at a tenth of the price of the newfangled railways. Barges don't trade anymore, but they still race though with Axel taking half a day to cut out one plank, the chances of Ina getting back on the water, let alone taking part in a race, look a long way off. Fed up with all the sawdust, Jerry's persuaded Rob to let him check over the engine. He obviously it wouldn't have had a diesel engine in it, so this all would have been, he would have had a master's cabin here, and this piece across here would have been the state room, what they called the state room in it. This was a flash barge. Was it a flash one? Yeah, a, a state, state room. room. Well, you can get sort of three people round a table. Yeah. <laughs> Few barges had engines until after World War II, and even then, they were only meant to be used when the wind didn't blow. This one had done 200,000 miles in a truck before going to sea. Remarkably, the only thing Jerry found it needed was a service and a bit of tweak into a dodgy fuel pump. Up on top, Axel's preparing plank number 78. Before it's fitted, part of the edge at the top is planed away. So when it's butted up next to its neighbour, there will be a deep V-shaped groove between them. A special string will then be rammed into the groove and topped off with tar to make the deck watertight. The first job is to push the new plank hard up against its neighbour using a hydraulic jack. Then two holes are drilled down into the oak deck beam below before Axel gets all macho with a sledgehammer and smashes it into place with the huge six inch nails shipwrights call spikes. Once the head of the spike is at deck level, Claire steps in with a punch so Axel can whack the spike in until it disappears an inch or so below the surface. By the time the deck is finished, the 180 or so planks on Ina's deck will have been fixed down with around 1500 spikes each one drilled, hammered, then punched into place. But they're not done yet. It's crucial that the deck is every bit as strong and as waterproof as a hull. To finish the job, 12-inch nails are whacked in horizontally, pinning the plank to its neighbour, forming a solid sheet of wood. Dunsky, that's a good one. We did that. We did that. And we're going to do another one. Luke's hoping that Ina will be so well restored that he'll be living on her for the rest of his life. But when he bought her two years ago, the first few nights he spent on board made him realise the enormity of the task he'd set himself. Yeah, it took a few weeks before it sort of really sank in. But uh, it was quite strange as well to start with because being away from barges for such a long time that uh, I wasn't quite used to all the noises and the creaks and the wind and, and things like that. And, that. and that's what really brought the responsibility of the barge to me, having to... I was the one that had to go up and tie everything up and, and make sure that she wasn't taking on too much water and, and things like that. And it really sort of hit to me then that that, that was me and that, that was part of me and how important it was to me as well. Yeah, in some ways, having Ina's just like being a dad, it's sort of, there's so many responsibilities and looking after her and, and making sure everything's okay and giving her everything she needs at the end of the day. I mean, I should hope she's been around a long time before I was born and I should hope she'll be around a long time after I die as well. And it's sort of being part of keeping her up and, and keeping her going really at the end of the day. You see so many barges nowadays that, that end up in the scrap heaps and just moored up and rotting away. Luke's had to spend the last year in a caravan, but now it looks like he'll soon be back on board. The planks of her deck are almost finished, and in a couple of weeks, his dad, Rob, is planning to float her out of the dock. To meet his target, he's brought in enough labour to build a pyramid. Outside, 
the squad are under orders to take on the biggest paint job they've ever come across. In all, Ina carries about 4,000 square feet of sail. To stop them rotting or chafing on the rigging, barge crews would paint or dress them once a year with a mixture of cod oil, urine and a colouring called red ochre. It's a bit of a big fella. I didn't think it was this big, did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just keeps going. A bit more. Oh, Jerry, let's go over that side. Axel, drag Twist it, it round. Luckily, times have moved on and there's now a modern sail paint that doesn't stink of dead fish and wee-wee. Still, painting 4,000 square feet of canvas would have daunted even Leonardo. Right, Jack, are we ready? Lovely broomstick action, guys. After four hours on the floor, I think we can safely say that the squad can't dance. But at least the sails are a nice reddish colour. Back on board, Rob's girlfriend Liz is on stopping duty. Knocking each of the spikes down below the deck level has left 1,500 holes, each of which Liz is having to fill in with a length of dowling. Once the glue is dry, they'll be planed flat to create a perfectly smooth deck. Tough job, not half as tough as filling in the V-shaped grooves between the planks. The idea is to ram in a special string called oakum to form a flexible seal, which is then topped off with a layer of tar. The technique's called caulking and is one of the oldest of the shipwright's arts. Underneath the hull, Claire's cheating. The cracks between Ina's planks would traditionally have been caught in the same way as the decks. But allegedly, this modern expandable foam does the same thing much quicker. <laughs> the crack is about this big. <laughs> There's nothing going in there at all. But even if it's useless, it's still a good laugh. <laughs> One of the best jobs I've ever had. In fact, although it looks a right mess, once it's hardened off and the excess cut away, it does seem to do the trick, leaving a solid seal deep within the crack. Let's just hope it's waterproof, because all this lot will be under the water in a few weeks' time. With everybody busting their gut to get Ina finished, Rob and me went down below to check out Ina's brasswork. Here we are. Dunkirk 1940. Do you know what it did over there, did it? No, I'm not just, no, it, it was one of the Dunkirk little ships. Now, those plaques make Ina a very special barge indeed. In 1940, with World War II less than a year old, Britain was staring defeat in the eye. France had as good as fallen to the Germans, and most of the British army was surrounded on the beaches of Dunkirk. In desperation, the government ordered the most daring rescue in military history. Every available ship, from the best the Navy had, to fishing boats and even river cruisers, were pressed into service. In just 10 days, they rescued around 220,000 British and French troops who lived on to fight another day. Well, that's something that uh, quite like to find out what happened here. I mean, there's possibly some survivors knocking about who may well have even been brought back yeah, on the boat. Well be, yeah. To find out more about Ina's role at Dunkirk, Rob put me in touch with her previous owners, R and W Paul of Ipswich, and I arranged to meet up with Brian Pinner, who'd looked after Ina at Paul since the 1970s. As we chatted in a local yacht club, Brian told me the most incredible story. Ina had indeed gone to Dunkirk in 1940, but with the German forces closing in, her skipper, Alfred Page, was forced to abandon her on the beaches and escape on a Navy destroyer. As far as the company knew, their barge had been lost, along with many others, on the beaches of the French coast. That was until they got a phone call from an irate harbour master in Kent. Uh, a few weeks later, we had a telephone call from uh, the harbour master at Deal, suggesting that we collected our barge. So we, we, we sent 
Well, the company then sent um, the skipper down to collect it, and um, which he duly did. But when he got back, he said that everything had movable had been taken, including his false teeth, which he'd left in a glass of water by the bur by his bunk. <laughs> Just how Ina found her way back to the Kent coast remained a bit of a mystery, until after she attended the 40th anniversary of the Dunkirk evacuation. Well, after we'd been there to the 1980 anniversary, um, there was an article in the Daily Telegraph um, about the reunion. As soon as it appeared, Brian was inundated with old soldiers all claiming it was they who sailed Ina back from the beaches. There was a letter from a Captain Attlee who said that he actually brought the barge back. After that, I had a, a, another gentleman, John Cook, came from the East Yorks Regiment, uh, who said, no, he brought her back. And later than that, uh, an Eric Stewart from the 1st Lancashire Regiment came along and said, no, 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 I brought her back. And I have even had a, visit, a visitor from, the Kent, from Kent who said, I came back on her. So who would you say is the best person to go and see then, with regards to who brought her back from Dunkirk? Well, Captain Attlee was there. His story is very plausible and in fact would accommodate what other people said as well. So he's the man? He's the man. With Captain Attlee seeming the best bet, I headed off to York to track him down while the squad was getting Ina ready for her first voyage in over a year, out of the dock and round the corner to a new berth where the squad will help reunite her with her mast and sails. The underside of her hull has now been painted and the decks have had a lick too, but there are a few last minute fittings to add. But the main task is to clear a year's worth of junk. Jerry hauls up the anchor, while the others help take down the tarpaulins that have been protecting Ina's decks from the elements for a year. Ina has been sitting inside Rob's imaginative dry dock furnished from the hull of an old freighter. It might look like a load of old scrap, but it's a work of pure genius. Every high tide, the freighter floats, lifting Ina with her and keeping her dry. But today, Rob is going to pull the plug, allowing water to pour into the freighter's hull, sinking her and allowing Ina to float free. And when I say plug, I mean plug. That's all it is. One little hole at the back with a cap bolted on the top. Once Rob's got it unscrewed, nature will do the sinking. The tide here rises some 18 feet in six hours, and soon the freighter is beginning to take on water, so there's not a moment to lose, because once Ina's floating, the water will only be deep enough to clear the jagged edge of the freighter for about half an hour. He was telling me all sorts of lurid tales of when the dock, ha dock hasn't sunk quite right, including a time when they only half opened the valves and the whole lot went like that before it finally sort of slid in. If there's any hold up, then, before they know it, Ina will be aground, stranded half inside and half outside the dock. The squad are hoping that soon she'll once more look like this, a fully rigged Thames sailing barge. But before that happens, there's a short but perilous voyage to make from the dock to her new berth. Once she's floating, they'll have about half an hour to tow her out before she's aground again. If they get it wrong, Ina will end up stuck, half in and half out of the dock, a hole broken over the stern of the old freighter. It's D-Day for Ina, the Thames sailing barge. The old freighter she's been lying in is sinking nicely and Ina is about to feel the water around her hull for the first time in a year. Close to high tide, Rob and his girlfriend Liz get the tugboat ready, taking Abel Seaman Axel with them. As Ina begins to float, the effects of a year out of the water are making themselves felt. The planks of her hull have shrunk and, despite Claire's best efforts, water is seeping through the cracks, so the pumps are going full blast. As soon as the tug arrives, Axel gets the tow rope on board and Ina can begin her first voyage in over a year. The 
There's only a few inches to spare on each side, and the main job for those on board will be to make sure Ina's hull doesn't hit the jagged remains of the freighter. She's out of the dry dock with minutes to spare, but they still have to get her through a maze of old holes and around the corner to her new mooring before the tide recedes. The next time Ian is underway, the squad hope that it will be under sail with Luke and his dad at the wheel. To get there, they'll have to help reinstall a rig, a 100 foot mast and five massive sails. But for the moment, the drama's over. Ian has made it safely to a new berth and it's time to pop a beer. Alec Pluck is one of the few old time barge skippers left and he's been helping out Rob and the squad. He doesn't miss the bargeman's pay but he does miss the food. If I earned four pound a week, it was a lot of money. And stuff was on ration, so you give your ration books to your mum, because you didn't worry about that, because you could nick enough off the ships to live on. <laughs> you only had to go up and see the top man on the ship and give him five bob, and he'd drop half a sheep over the side or half a cow. And if he was good, he'd drop two half a cows over the side, and you'd flog the other bit when you got down to Colchester or somewhere like that. Would you change it? Would you ever think, oh, office job? You know, nice and warm. Oh, God, no, no, this is real, real life. I, I, I thought it was very hard work, and when I said to my old dad, I said, well, uh, you know, well, it's not very much money, Dad. He said, well, he said, it's not a job. He said, not a while living. He said, and if you can nick off enough off the land and enough off them ships when you're up in the dock, he said, you live well. That Alec, Claire and the rest of the salvage squad are able to live well on Ina's deck today is little short of a miracle, as over 60 years ago she'd been dumped along with many others on the beaches of Dunkirk, only to turn up back in Blighty weeks later. The full story of how Ina escaped has never been told, which is why I've headed to York, where I've tracked down the man I think may have saved her 62 years ago, 88-year-old Noel Attlee. At that time, a young captain in the North York's regiment. Does this ring any bells for you? Well, it's something like that. It was a Thames barge, I um, think. Do you remember the name of it? Yes, it was a boat with ENA. ENA. Well, if you look there, at the bottom. Oh, it is the ENA. E that's the very boat. Does it bring back any memories? Yes, I thought it was bigger than that. <laughs> Captain Attlee and his men were among the last British troops to arrive on the beaches during the evacuation. They were told there were no more boats. Finish. So, oh my God, what do we do now? Looked up there about uh, two or three hundred yards away in the sea was this barge. Realising that this abandoned barge was his last chance, Captain Attlee got as many men on board as he could and raised the anchor to head for home. But as we're doing that, the Germans dropped a, a bomb in front of us. I saw it leave the, sh the plane and just missed the ship by about 20 feet. And the, the bomb just lifted the boat straight out of the water and down again. Riddled us with machine gun bullets too. Our sails were riddled with... Uh, senior bullets from the aircraft fire. And I was getting frightened at this time and said, it's time we we're off. Until he boarded Ina, Captain Attlee's only experience of boats was a childhood holiday on the Norfolk Broads. Yet amongst all the bombs and bullets the Luftwaffe could throw at him, he managed to sail her clear of the French coast. A, a cruise, small cruiser or something came across and hailed us said, where were we from? We said, Dunkirk. They uh, threw tins of food aboard, and uh, I, I couldn't order anybody about them. They're all sort of running around trying to open these tins. They couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and they towed us into uh, Margate. How many men did you bring back? I think it was about 35 or 36 or something, with few wounded. 
how the hell it happened. Somebody was looking after us, I don't know how it happened. But that's a perfectly true story and uh, I can't say more about it. Without Captain Attlee, Ina would have been left a wreck on the beach at Dunkirk. And without Ina, Captain Attlee and 36 others would have been condemned to a prison camp or worse. Instead, she's still with us, her hull replanked, her deck replaced, and reunited with her mast. Now the squad are hoping to get her back sailing as soon as possible. Your axle still seems to be smashing her apart. We're just fitting a, bit, a new bit of metal work onto here. It guards this chain rubbing out this bit of deck for the lee boards. For those of you, like me, who are nautically illiterate, a word of explanation is due. The lee boards are two dirty, great tear-shaped bits of metal that can be lowered down to act as a kind of nautical brake to stop Ina slipping sideways when she's sailing. The problem is that the chain that pulls the lee board up and down runs over the wooden rail on Ina's side. The metal, Axel's pulling off, acts as a kind of guard to stop the wood being worn away, but it's seen better days and needs replacing. Which is why Axel's going wading. I can walk on mud. By the 1970s, the last of the Thames sailing barges had lost their long battle against modern motorised transport. And the estuaries of the East Coast are full of skeletons like this, those less fortunate than Ina. Luckily, they serve as a pretty good second-hand shop for bargy bits and bobs for those few that remain. Brilliant. That's a bit rough. Huh? But um, the laws of salvage be explained to me, if we look around here, any boat that's not tied up and is floating adrift or just like it is here, sunk, you can come and get any bits you like. That's the law of salvage. So anybody out there who wants a bit of a boat, if it ain't tied up, it's yours. And this bit here is ours for our boat. Now, just before you all turn off your TV and run down to the local marina, I should just point out that if you untie the boat you claim to be salvaging, or have somehow enticed it onto the rocks, then that's called nicking, and you'll find the strong arm of the law flinging a fairly hefty book at you. However, if you need a bit of metal to guard your rail from a bit of chain, and there is a genuine wreck down the road, then, like Axel, you have the law on your side. Come on, go. It's too much like hard work. Why don't we just go buy one? Partly because it costs money, but mainly because then you lot wouldn't have the fun of watching Axel wallowing in the mud. <sighs> Waders coming off. Whoops. Yeah, I know it would be funny if I fell over, wouldn't it? I'm not going to give you the pleasure. I hope. Back on board, Axel's first job is to stop water damaging the wooden rail under the metal guard. And to do it, he's going to apply a rather traditional compound. Believe it or not, this is actually horse doo-doo mixed in with tar. Yeah, it is. Ooh. The reason that it's got horse poo in there is to make the tar not so runny. It's like a binding agent, maybe, hold it all together. Horse poo and tar. Look there, you can actually see the straw. Lovely. While Axel was happily nailing on his bit of salvage, Jerry was helping to put on Ina's mainsail. The two biggest sails on Ina, the mainsail and the topsail, can only be fixed on when the mast is down. The first job is to attach the top of the mainsail onto the end of the huge sprit a massive lump of wood that runs up from the bottom of the mast and holds up the top of the sail. Unfortunately, when it's lowered, it sticks out over Ina's stern, and the lads are keen to find out if Jerry's got the makings of a sailor man. Lads, we're getting a lot near the end of the boat here. 
<laughs> oh. I've done a lot of stupid things for salvage squad, but this gentleman is taking the biscuit. Yeah, it's quite short, they said. So it's got a hook. Yay. That way, right, grand. Hang on. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Can anybody see whether that's round? Because I tell you, I am not going any further out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look, it, it's very strange because it doesn't look, you know, you're sitting here and you think, eh, no problems at all, but it just seems an awful long it's way plop. It is in the mind, actually, yeah. It is, really. Yeah. Two riots in the mind. It's five foot out from the boat and six feet up from the water. Yeah, Hardcore right. wimps territory. Unlike where Claire's going, along the mast, to tie on the front of the topsail to the top mast, it's attached to a set of giant curtain rings that sailors call hoops. With the tops all on, the squad can start the hardest work of all, winching up four tons of mast and sail. Ready? Let's go on then. It's going to go up in two sections. First, the main 50-foot mast, and then the top mast, another 40 foot or so of timber. The only problem is that to raise the mast one foot takes about 64 turns on the winch handles, and with about four tonnes to be lifted, it's one of the toughest jobs on a barge. Now you might think that all of this is a bit old-fashioned and inefficient, but those masts and sails are every bit as powerful as the engine in any modern truck. Given the right wind, they can push 73 tonnes of boat and 160 tonnes of cargo along at around 10 knots. In all, it takes about two hours of back-breaking work to lift the main mast and sails up to the vertical. It looks good, doesn't it? Yeah. Nearly there. I'm knackered. I'm totally pooped. <laughs> How many people used to do this? Two people, man and boy. Man and boy. But if you're going under lots of, lots and lots of bridges, say going up the Thames, yeah. uh, they used to take people on, because you have to drop the mast to get under the bridge. Right. And they used to actually take someone on, whose sole purpose would be to wind the mast up and down, and then kick him off once they'd done with him. Stop it. I hope they paid him for good money. <laughs> Sounds like Axel was angling for a pay rise, but he's only done half the work. There's still 40 foot of top mast to go up, and this winch seems even slower. Once it's up, there's only one task left, to climb 30 foot up a dodgy rope ladder, then another 10 foot up a ladder that's been temporarily tied in place to insert a pin through the bottom of the top mast that will stop it crashing down again. More an axle than a jerry sort of job. Yep. Has it crossed the bed? Yes, yeah, it crosses, it's about and that far out the other side. No, it's got across the bed. Bit more. Just a little bit more. Right. All right. Bye. Right, right, leg down. Now the pin's in, the rig's finished. It might look like a mad cobweb of rope and wood, but when she's underway, those ropes holding up her mast will have to deal with forces of around five tonnes. Let's just hope they're up to it. It's a week since the mast went up, but so far, spring gales have stopped the squad from taking her out. But today the wind is set fair and Ina's sails are about to go up. 
the dogs on board, and the oldest cabin boy in the business has been out to round up the owner, Luke Deards. How long have you been out of it now? Um, it's got to be close to two years now. Two years? Yeah. So you're finally going into your proper home again. I am. Here we go. I'm going to do it this way, if you don't mind, <laughs> to be safe. Hello, Jerry. Hi, Max. Hi. All right. Hello. Well, first things first, is this the life draft? It is the life draft, right. yeah. This is mine. <laughs> Before we go any further, this is actually... women and children? I think you'll find it's actually bald men and children <laughs> first, Claire. I think you've been quite miserable about the capability of Ina. She's going to sail, isn't she? She is, definitely. Yeah. Why are you wearing a life jacket? Because um, I can't swim. You can't swim? No. You live on a boat. But yeah. You can't swim. But when you live on a boat all your life, the last all your life, the last thing you want to do is fall in the water. Fair enough. <laughs> has, has the work been for you? You got the sails up? It's oh, been. Been. Did you put them up? Kinda. What does that mean? You yeah, winch the mast up. Yeah, we had to winch all this stuff up, yeah. Get you winch that up? Yeah. Oh what on this? No. With that. Yeah. The big monster yeah, at the front. The big monster there. gets that up and that. Sixty four turns to yeah. rise one foot. You're joking. No, no joke. How long that take? Too long. Should we have a little wander down to... Yeah, is it the, what's the back end called? The stern. The stern. Let's wander to the stern. It still seems a little bit sort of tatty at this end. It's not tatty. No, what I'm it's saying is it's, it's untidy is the word. I busy. Mean, busy. OK, I'll go with that. When they arrived, Ina was a rotting hulk. With chainsaws and sledgehammers, they rebuilt the deck, painted 4,000 square foot of sails with yard brushes, then winched up four tons of mast, and now she's sailing again. But unfortunately for Axel, though, the winching ain't over. As Ina takes to the seas again, the first job is to winch up the 900 square foot topsail its huge white cross being the symbol of the original owners, R and W Paul. With the topsail set, the mainsail can be pulled from the mast. And finally, as she makes her way down the estuary, it's Jerry's turn to do some of the hard work. Inch by inch, the Yena's foresaw snakes skyward. All this sailorish activity was making my stomach remind me that I was a landlubber born and bred, and I retired to the blunt end for a sit down with Ina's happy owner. I've, I've, I'm not feeling too bad. I just started to feel a little bit ugh about it. Does it not bother you at all? No, it don't, really doesn't bother me at all. Is yeah. it opposite? Do you get house sick? <laughs> um, I certainly miss the water, yeah. I really? certainly miss this. Just when I was beginning to think Luke had a point, things started to go wrong up the sharp end. The wind had got up to a false five, which as the nautically inclined will know, is a tad breezy, and bits of Ina's rig decided to show their age. Come in, the wind again. The rope that holds on the bottom of a giant foresaw decided to go ping, allowing Jerry to redeem his earlier wimpishness and play the big butch hero for a while. And then, the top of the sail decided to part company with its rope, and around 500 square feet of canvas descended to the deck. The main problem was that the bit of rope to pull it back up again was now 40 foot up the mast, and it took a far braver man than Jerry to go aloft to retrieve it. 20 minutes later, and we're sailing again. We shouldn't be too hard on Ina. Given that she's not sailed for more than a year, it's hardly surprising something started to play up. In a wind like this, your family kite, a mere two square foot of material, will exert a force of around 10 pounds. The rope on Ina's foresaw had to deal with around 250 times that force. But once the skies began to clear, I could see why Luke could never dream of being away from a barge. Excellent. Worth every minute. 
Ina was launched 96 years ago and spent the next 94 years with the firm of R&W Paul. But now she's about to start a second life in the hands of a mere whippersnapper of a boy. Rob, you've been arguing a wheel all day. I think it's time for a bit of a formal handover from father to son. Now, son. Here's <laughs> <laughs> your head, eh? Nice one, you have plenty of happy style in it. <laughs> Just say right, say children. Uh oh. Yeah! Hey. Go on, Luggy. No, no, right, you can't go You're not that, you can't do that, really. How'd they do, Rob, work wise? Uh, not too bad, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, not, not too bad for the beginners. I think with a bit more practice, another 10 or 15 years, and they'd be quite good. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get us back over, yeah. right? Probably not, no. Probably not. <laughs> Have we got any food? Anybody fancy salad of France? <laughs> yeah, I'll have some of that, Luke. Oh, what around there? Ina has seen nearly a century of history. When she was launched, there were 2,000 barges on the river. At 34, she survived the hell of Dunkirk and sailed on for another 60 years, until long after most other barges were abandoned on the mudflats. Now, with the help of the squad, Luke and his dad hope she'll go on for another 60 years, keeping the wonders of the barge alive on the River Thames. Well, well.